at the University of Chicago, an economist, uh, received her PhD from Harvard, and I looked up something on TED. I imagine many of you know about the TED website, but if you don't, by all means go there, because there's a very uh, provocative and compelling 16-minute uh, lecture that Emily gives that's there. And from there, they argue that you should listen to her. She's a fellow at the Becker Center at the University of Chicago, has a history of rethinking conventional wisdom. Her Harvard doctoral thesis took on famed economist Lamar Sen and his claim that 100 million women were statistically missing from the developing world. He blamed misogynist medical care and outright sex-selective abortion on the gap, but both are pointed to data indicating that in countries where hepatitis D infections were higher, more boys were born. Through her unorthodox analysis of medical data, she accounted for 15% of the missing girls. She's also investigated the role of bad weather and the rise of witchcraft trials in medieval Europe and what drives people to play the Powerball lottery. Her latest target, at least in this head lecture, busting assumptions on HIV in Africa. She was quoted by Esquire as the follows, at just 26, economist Emily Oster may have the highest controversy generated to years in academia ratio of anyone in her field. For coming. Um, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about this, this missing women issue in general, trying to think about gender inequality uh, in India, how we might measure and understand a uh, phenomenon of, of sort of excess mortality among girls. Um, I want to then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some work I've done on kind of uh, related issues of gender inequality, looking at the impacts of television on, uh, on inequality in India. So we'll be kind of a little bit all over the map. But hopefully you'll see uh, you'll see the connections. Um, I uh, in economics we're accustomed to people just shouting angry things in the middle of talks. So I'm very happy to have you shout or talk quietly or or interrupt in the middle. And so if you if you have questions as we go along, um, please please do ask. I would I would encourage that as opposed to waiting till the end. Okay. So, um, so what we're going to do, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk first about some sort of basic facts on gender inequality in India in particular. I'm going to talk about thinking about counting missing women, what's, what's the concept of, of missing women. Uh, I'm going to talk about why we think they're missing. I'll talk in a little bit about other ways in which there, there are inequalities other than just excess mortality, other ways in which women are perhaps less well off than they are in the developed world. Um, and then I'll, I'll think, uh, I'll talk a little bit at the end about uh, strategies to address this. Let's say a little bit about, about thinking papers, not by me, but by a few other people who have thought about trying to make women more valuable economically, uh, and then about this, uh, this stuff about television. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page about what I mean when I say uh, that women are missing. So this is a graph uh, of the, the sex ratio, the ratio of, of number of, uh, of women for every man. Uh, in a bunch of different countries. So this is just, you count up the people in the population, there's some number of women, some number of men, divide the number of women by the number of men. So you can see in, in the first three bars are Kenya, the US, and France. And in all those places there are slightly more, uh, there are slightly more women than men. In fact, uh, in basically all human populations, we're slightly more likely to give birth to male children, um, but then men are more likely to die at all ages due to general weakness. And, um, and so, so that the result, when you look at the overall population, there's, there's slightly more women. Now the contrasting cases over here are China, India, and Pakistan. And you can see that, that those, uh, those places are actually have populations that are overall more heavily male rather than, than more heavily female. And people have talked, this used to be, these things used to be red, but I guess PowerPoint, the more recent PowerPoint has screwed me. Um, but you can see that, that when we talk about missing women, we talk about the idea that, that relative to these other places, China, India, Pakistan, there are a few other countries in this category, have, have fewer, uh, fewer men. There's no particular reason that we would expect that to be true other than excess, other than excess mortality of, of girls and, and of women. And so there's some number of people that kind of should exist such that these countries would look like the other countries. And uh, the fact that they don't, we call those, those are referred to as missing women. They're missing from the population, something happened to them. Okay, so that's what we mean by my missing women. Now, 
there are other ways. So this is, gets a lot of focus in uh, in talks about gender inequality, and I think for good reason. Uh, mortality is important. Death is definitely uh, is definitely really bad. Um, but there actually are a lot of other ways looking at, at data on uh, people's behavior that we can see uh, that women are, are perhaps less well off than men. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of some of these, I'm going to show you a little bit of data from a national household survey in India. Uh, and they asked women, in this case, a series of questions which people interpret as uh, representing their autonomy or, or their, um, how well off they are in the household. So the first of these is a question who decides about women obtaining health care? So this is asked about you. So you are a woman. You're in a household. They ask you, who decides if you don't feel well, do you get to go to the doctor or not? OK. So, um, so the, about a quarter of the women in the sample, a little more than a quarter, say that they make this decision on their own. Another uh, about a quarter of them say that they decide jointly with husband or others. And this, this bar here represents people who say this part of the pie represents people who say that somebody else may, is the only decision maker. So their husband or their in-laws make this decision for them. So I don't feel well. I, I say I don't feel well. And my husband says, well, you look fine to me. Um, why, don't you, why don't you just stick it out and, and wait to see how it goes? All right. Similarly, ask people, do you need permission to, to visit your family? So about a quarter of women in this sample say, no, I don't need permission. If I want to go visit my parents, Typically, these are married women. They're not living with their parents. I don't, I don't need permission. About three quarters of them say, you know, yes, of course, I need to ask permission. But about 2% of the women in this sample say, I'm just not allowed to do that. It doesn't really ask permission, not ask permission. I am not allowed to go visit my family. Finally, I think for me, this one is probably the most, uh, the, the most striking. Women are asked about a series of, of situations Asked, is it acceptable for a husband to beat his wife in the following situations? And remember, this is being asked to the women. And the question isn't, does this happen? The question is, is this acceptable? Do you find this to be like defensible behavior? And these are the situations. So wife is unfaithful. The wife's family doesn't give money. She's disrespectful. She goes out without telling him. She neglects the children. She doesn't do a good job cooking. Um, and so the maximum of these, which is sort of neglecting children, going out without telling her, are at about 35%. I mean, 35% of women say if a woman goes out without telling her husband, it is acceptable for him to beat her. And in fact, this is not just the same 35% of women. About 65% of women in this sample list at least one of these situations as an acceptable beating situation. So I think you know, we, come, we come away from this, or at least I come away from this, thinking there's a lot of evidence, both, both in the excess mortality, but also just in general in these um, in, in the responses to these questions, that women are perhaps, perhaps not as well off as, uh, as, as they might be. Now, I think it is very, yeah? No, well, I think too many in terms of some self reported social norms, if we weren't just in the I completely agree. So the, question? so the question was you don't want to make a lot of inference from some self reported social norms, you'd like to observe behavior. I completely agree. However, uh, the, what I will say is about something like this, I would be surprised if this understated the extent to which this is occurring. I mean, I think, you know, it, in some sense, it, if the question was, and actually there are questions like this in at least some of these, these surveys, um, where it says, have you ever been beaten by your husband? Of course, those numbers are, are very high. So I think, I think I completely am on board with, like, behaviors are more important than, than self-reported stuff. And this will come up again at the, at the end when I talk about this TV stuff, because a lot of the outcomes are are self-reported. You know, having said that, with some of this stuff, I think she's saying, like, this is OK. You know, maybe it's not happening. But I think if you ask women in the US, is it OK for your husband, probably mostly would say no. I agree. It's just, uh, ah, completely, completely agree. Completely agree. So you don't know how much of the, the mortality difference you saw on the first slide is from selective gender abortion? I'm going to talk about how much is due to what things in a minute. So um, the answer is we'll, I'll try to, we've made some progress on that. It varies across space. But yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Um, OK, so, so I would say overall, we get a little bit of a picture that perhaps women are not, not as well off. And I, I should say, like, you know, we, you want to be a little careful always about like, the imposition of Western ideas about well off. 
in these um, in these settings. You know, it could be that people don't want to make decisions about their health care or they think the beating is they really mean it's fine. It's totally fine with me. I mean, I like I, I have a personally difficult time with that claim. However, I think um, there there is something say because this is an ethics talk. There is there are some ethical questions about making kind of uh, judgments, imposing imposing various Western style standards on on this. However, I will say excess mortality is probably bad, regardless of who you who you think you are. Uh, How, I will also say, even if you don't care at all about women, this is unimportant to you. Um, there are actually other reasons why, uh, at least economists think that that having women have more say in the household, uh, be be more powerful, is is important. So uh, m women with more say tend to with more education. They themselves get more education, and then that has that has large impacts on both their children's education and their children's health. To the extent that you think that education is important for economic growth, which we often, which we often do, um, this suggests that you know, having women with some bargaining power is important for growth. Um, there, similarly, there's evidence that, uh, that when women are controlling the money in the household, it goes to better things. Um, the kind of canonical example is you give women some money, they spend it on food. You give men some money, they spend it on beer and, and gambling. I don't, you know. It certainly sounds true to me, uh, but you know, I, I, there is sort of, there is some evidence uh, along these lines. Um, and then I think there's this sort of basic point, which is like, if women are if women are spending a lot of time walking around asking their husbands, well, can I go do this? Can I go do this? Can I work? Can I not work? You know, that's just a waste of time. I mean, this is a productive part of the labor force. Having them do stuff that is productive is probably good. Okay. So getting to the question of why, of why women are missing. So there's basically two, um, there's basically two ways to, I think, think about the question of why. Um, and I, I think very broadly, the kind of the two areas, the two things that are important are some amount of sex selective abortion and some amount of excess death after birth. That's not a statement that you need research to, uh, to come up with. That's just a statement about how people get to be surviving. Um, and I'll say in a minute a little bit about how much is in which of the, yeah. Can I just, uh, before we launch, I ask yeah. uh, how unassailable the observation is, uh, which I presume comes from primarily census data. And I could just imagine ways that it could be distorted right out of the blocks, like uh, urban versus rural. If you got to better capture people in an urban environment, the males went to an urban environment for employment right, right off the top. So if you had any gaps in the uh, accuracy of your census data, uh, it, sure. or is that just not even? Yeah, so what I'm going to show you is that is that we can look at um, like kids' death rates for, for boys and girls in India, and we can see the death rates relative to what you'd expect. It's a little hard to do this, but the death rates for girls are much are much too high. In fact, a lot of this is about things that happen in childhood, and I, so I think um, I think the, the point is well taken that like if you just went to some, you know, if you went to Alaska, you would conclude like a lot of women are missing in Alaska. That's presumably not because a lot of Alaskan, you know, women have been have been killed. H having said that, if you looked at you know kids ages zero to three in Alaska, and you saw that there were a lot more boys, that might lead you to think something else. And this is more in the latter category. Um, yeah. Um, so the question is, why are these missing women and not extra men? I mean, I, I obviously, okay, yes, extra men. Um, I think the reason that we, the reason that, that people say missing women is because they envision that something that basically at birth or at, like, let's say at conception, we're, we're at the appropriate thing and then something happens after that which causes the women to disappear as opposed to causes the men to like multiply um, and so I think that's but there you know you could I don't sure that it that it's so important which thing whether it's too many men or not enough women is there something are you getting in something else that I'm not responding to Sure. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's actually a very reasonable way to think about it. That basically you would say, look, there's some set of technologies which are being provided to men to help them survive. Those technologies are not being provided to women. Whether you view that as this is discrimination against women or like anti-discrimination against men, I think is actually a a reasonable. Yeah. 
so but then I think I think that the point to make there is that is that there's not a lot of reason to think that there's a lot of differences across populations in this. And um, and most populations have a, a very set way that this happens. More boys at birth, more death among boys later. There's you'd have to think, I mean you could think like look, the Chinese are just not like us, but given how much um, the Chinese people and white people are very different, but given how much genetic material is shared across populations, I think, and given that there are reasons that this should be equal. Yeah. That's the argument that's made for the difference in lifespan in the first group, not the third group. The greater lifespan of women in our country, for example, than men. And in the first group, in general, that's that argument is made. Why, why aren't men living longer in the first group right. than women are? But I see. You're saying like there's too like in some sense in the first world we could say there are too many women because they're getting these. You could you could have more of that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So so within this category of why I think there's basically two two ways to conceptualize this. One part of why is just asking, like, why literally why are people dying? So it's more people die than you would expect. What is it that's occurring that is making that happen? That's like kind of like approximate cause form of why. Then there's a deeper kind of causal why, which is just like, why, don't, why, why is this occurring? Why don't people value female children? Why don't they value women? What is it that's causing you know, women to die more in childbirth than they should otherwise? And, and so on. Like, what are the underlying societal factors which are driving this? So let's talk a little bit about both of those. So, um, so I think the, the first thing here is this, is this kind of why, proximate cause why. And there I think the, the first place we want to look, uh, we want to look is, is just to try to understand what age groups is this important for. Now in India, getting to the sex selective abortion part, in India, until the relatively recent period, the, the sex ratio at birth was actually quite, like pretty close to normal. Um, it has more recently gotten quite skewed in a lot of, in a lot of places. It's difficult to, to measure the extent of sex selective abortion just directly. There are some recent estimates, a Lancet article, I think in 06, which put the number at like 10 million sex selective abortions in the last, you know, X, um, X years. In some places it's very, very extreme. So in the 2000 census in China, the sex ratio of birth was 1.2 rather than 1.05, so 1.2 boys for every one girl rather than 1.05 boys for every one girl. That's a pretty extensive amount of sex selection. In India, at least, his, at least until the very recent period, I think the problem has been much more uh, concentrated in things that happen after, after birth. Um, so, uh, so I think that, you know, the first way to think about this is just ask at what age, um, at what age did these things did these things happen? I think the obvious way to do this is to just look at death rates by age for men and women and see, you know, where is it that we're kind of losing the women? That's a sort of obvious way to do this. The problem with this, the thing that makes this a little bit, a little bit tricky uh, in practice um, is that boys are in, in populations in the, you know, the US, Africa, kind of comparable, comparable or not so comparable uh, places, boys are basically always more likely to die. They're just, I don't know what it is, at pretty much every age, men are more likely to die. So actually, this, this thing where you just look at death rates for boys and death rates for girls is, not, is, is a little tricky, because what you see is mostly, in India also, boys are more likely to die. But that's not really answering the question. What you really want to know is relative to what you'd, what you'd expect. And so I've done a little bit of work trying to think about this basically comparing this to another country, saying, look, in the absence of some extra discrimination, uh, the India would look kind of like Africa in terms of its, of its ratios of boy to girl deaths. And that can give us some sense of just how, how high the, the excess deaths are for women. When you do that, you come to the conclusion that basically everything that's happening, all of these missing women, are occurring before the age of about five. That basically this is all about excess death in childhood, very little about excess death in adulthood. I don't think this should be so surprising since basically the two times that people die are at the beginning and then, and then at the end. And so the fact that, that this is all being counted for by childhood is mostly about saying just a lot of, a lot of death happens in, in childhood, much more than, than in kind of uh, early, like between, say, 10 and 45. 
Uh, okay, there's a, there's a kind of second part of this, which is just what exactly is going on? Like, oh, it's great to know that this is all happening before the age of five, but like, what is, what is occurring? Um, and so there, there are a bunch of possibilities here. So one is you're just not giving the kid, one obvious one is just infanticide, just kids, you just kill, kill the kids and that's it. Um, another possibility is you don't give them as much food, you don't give them as many vaccines, you give them less medical treatment, that there's some aspect of treatment which is being differentially uh, given to, to boys versus girls and that that's having an impact on their survival. Again, there's a, it's a, actually figuring out how important these things are is a little tricky because on the one hand, you could just say, look, do boys get vaccinated more than girls? So they do. In the data, like in these data on in India, boys are a lot more likely to be vaccinated than, than girls, or somewhat more likely to be vaccinated than girls are. The differences are significant, but the truth is they're small. There are a few percentage points. And the differences in, say, uh, malnutrition are quite a bit larger. The differences in medical treatment are, are larger. But that's not exactly the answer to the question, because actually vaccines are really important. So even relatively small differences in whether you get a measles vaccine are actually really important in whether or not you die, because a lot of people die from measles, many more than die from not getting taken to the doctor when they have a cough. And so you can, you can actually use you know, evidence that have come some combination of what is the difference in treatment level along with how important is this treatment for whether or not you're gonna, you're gonna die, and you can put those together and get some estimate of how important are these things uh, in, in explaining the mortality. So I did this in a paper which is in demography a year or so ago. I would say the, the, you know, the strongest takeaway is something like 20 to 30% of the excess mortality is explained in the last you know, 15 years can be explained by differences in vaccination rates. The vaccination rates differ a bit, some between boys and girls, and that that, that turns out to translate into pretty big mortality differences. Um, putting together vaccination, medical treatment, and malnutrition, you get to about 50%, suggesting that there's sort of 50% that at least based on where my work is now, is not, um, is not explained and may have something to do with outright infanticide or other things that we're not measuring in the data. Yeah? Does that include the judgment that <laughs> in a given community or household, <clears throat> choices are being made among female and, and male children? Uh, is, is that part of that calculus? Um, so, in... I mean, in like a statistical sense, we are adjusting for differences in the gender of your siblings. Um, there's, a, there's like a kind of an interesting and deeper related thing, which is that in a place like India where people like boys, let's just posit people like to have boys, um, when they have a girl child, they will then like to continue, right? So if you have people have like a simple rule, like I'm gonna have kids until I have a boy, then on average girls end up in quite large families, much larger than the average boy. And to the extent that having more kids is about, you know, leads you to, to die, then that's, you know, that's something you want to you wanna adjust for. But it's, it's hard to think about statistically, is that like an effect of discrimination or is that like something that you don't want? Is that a control or is that actually, actually an effect? And it's kind of an interesting thing and it does make a big difference. So family size is obviously quite important and does, and does cut down, does have an impact on the gender difference. No, but is it related to resources? Yeah. Yep. I think there's that, and I think there's also a, a factor which is that if you have a girl and then you have a you try to have a boy like right away afterwards, there's you know less time breastfeeding because then you kind of if people have the system which is I have a girl, I have a baby. If it's a girl, I start trying to get pregnant like the next minute, and then I'm not breastfeeding for very much. That's also that's also bad. No. No. Okay. So this is this is I this is a question on my micro in my micro class, but that's not right. Actually, it turns out at every uncon at every birth, there's a 50-50 chance of having a boy or a girl. So the overall population will always be 50-50. The thing that different, so you don't end up with more girls from that. The thing that is different is girls will be in bigger families. But you know, the, the population doesn't get skewed by these gender bias stopping rules. We can draw it up. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> All right. 
So the, the sort of second part of why, which I think is, is more interesting to, to economists at least, is trying to understand the, the, um, the kind of why, why in the deeper societal sense uh, kind of question. So uh, an economist, we like to think about things in, in uh, I, this is actually a set of slides from one time that my mother made me give a talk, give this talk at her school. Um, so one of the benefits, this is like, what are the cost benefits of children? One question is that you can pressure them to give talks, probably not as applicable here. Uh, more, more important, you know, you might like them. So that's some reason people have kids, they like them. Um, another thing is they can work on your, on your farm or in other ways to get money. So this is something, you know, that is good about your kids. Um, and then when you get old, they might take care of you or they might not, depending on how nice you've been, depending on whether you like them. Um, and then, of course, kids have, kids have costs. And we think about India, um, you have to feed them, maybe you have to send them to school, you have to give them clothes, this kind of standard stuff. Uh, and then, then in the Indian context, one thing people talk about a lot, and I think it's difficult to calibrate just how important this is, but the, the fact that, that weddings, that in, for certain people, weddings are very expensive, girls are expensive because you have to pay these, these dowries. And again, because dowry is technically not allowed, uh, it, it can be difficult to get estimates of how important it is, but I think anecdotal evidence suggests that it is important. Now, when we think about these, we think about whether these things are going to be responsible for, uh, for differences in, in gender-specific survival, I think the, the question is just which of them are gender-specific. So, you know, maybe liking them is gender specific, a little bit unclear. Um, what, the thing that's, that's up here that's probably the most strongly gender specific in the, ben, in the benefit category is things about labor and remittances. So boys are, are probably more helpful in, your, in the field, and they're also quite a bit more likely, especially in India, to be the people who are remitting money to you as you're, as you're old. Uh, and in the, in the cost thing, again, you know, food schooling probably pretty similar. Um, but the, these wedding things tend to be sort of gender, particularly female specific. So you actually get a little bit of a sense of whether these things are important uh, in, in magnitudes by looking at some, at some data. So uh, this, is, this is a graph showing you the relationship between girl survival and the, the percent of women working. So this is just descriptive. I'm not making any causal statements about this. This graph, this is just give you some sense of the possibility that these things might be related. So on the, on the x-axis here, we have the share of women. These are Indian states. We have the share of the women in the state who report that they work. And this goes, this actually ranges quite a lot. And then when we look at girls in kind of eight, ages 8 to 12, and as I said, this is after most of the excess mortality has occurred, uh, what are the, the share of girls? And you can see that, that in places where women work more, there's a, uh, there end up being a higher share of girls in the population. Um, overall. Now, there are actually a lot of ways to interpret this, but one way to interpret this is to say that, uh, that people look forward. They look, look, a lot of women here work. If I take care of my kid and she doesn't die, she can probably work, and then she can send me, she can send me money or she can support me even working as a, as a kid. Okay. Um, and uh, and then, again, as I said, the, the sort of cost side of this, which is the stuff about, about dowries, is really something we have less, uh, we have less data on, but, um, but is certainly anecdotally something people talk about. All right, so let's think about how, how status might improve. So this is like, if we say, look, there are some reasons why this, why this might be the case. Uh, there, it seems clear that there's, there are some problems. Yeah? Given your research question and your passion for this topic, why did you use that particular method of the question as opposed to something more direct in terms of asking people why this is happening? Oh, you mean this this thing? Oh, I just made this for this talk. This isn't something I do. I, this isn't this particular thing. I, this is not. I don't think this is just to give you a sense that maybe there are some data supporting the idea that that earnings is actually a much better paper. Unfortunately, not by me. Um, in China, doing which I'll talk about in a minute, which looks much tries to look much more directly at this earnings. This earnings pattern. Yeah, I wouldn't. This would be like maybe slide like graph one in a paper on this, but I haven't written that paper yet. Yeah. Especially for India, though, um, the remittance here is a little confabulated because that potential giving earnings possibly for your in-laws, not for your family of origin. For sure. Yeah. Um, and in fact, another way to another way to interpret this this result is to say that that in places, if women are working, they make more money, and what they say is like, I want to take care of the girls and you know suck it 
Uh, that's what I'm doing. Right. Um, and I think that's also an interpretation of this. And, that, and actually, all of these things where we look at earnings of women, uh, had how earnings of women change, is, um, are going to have this, this issue that it's, it's difficult to separate some kind of bargaining power story from a, like, I'm looking to the future story. Yeah, completely agree. All right. So, um, so I think you know, the ultimate kind of policy question is, how does this status, what may we do to, to improve this status? Um, and I think in, in the world that you think that this, uh, that these earnings issues are, are important, like the, you know, kind of one thing we might think about is how do you improve the labor market? How do you improve job, job opportunities, either actual or perceived uh, for women? I think uh, uh, in the cost side, we can think about sort of very direct, um, very direct things like make dowries illegal, at least in India, or think about kind of reimbursing, uh, reimbursing people for their, for their daughters. This may seem insane, but in fact, this is largely the way people have gone. I'll talk about that in a sec. So uh, just thinking a little bit about how, how more of this evidence on, um, on labor market opportunities and how those, how those impact things. So these are actually both papers by people who are not me, although I, in both cases, I wish that I had written them. Um, so the first one is, uh, is a paper on, on the price of tea in China, in which this woman, Nancy Xian, uh, looks at how survival of girls changes in China in areas where uh, tea production becomes more important over time. And so she's got like a very nice identification strategy, but basically it's women are important for picking tea. At some point, because of a decline in Maoism, uh, the people be able, begin to be able to produce tea again. Women are good at picking it. Uh, this increases sort of the relative income for women, both at the moment and in the future in these areas. And what you see is increases in survival and, of girls and education for girls in these areas where this, where this happens. And she interprets it in light of this kind of bargaining power story, although I think it, it, there are other interpretations of that as well. I think a second thing, which is in the Indian context, um, this is Munchie and Rosen's white paper, uh, which looks at what happens to school enrollment for girls in India after the introduction of globalization. So one of the things that globalization to introduce, but uh, that, that over the kind of last 20 years in India, one of the things that's happened, in, at least in some states, is there have been, a, there's been an increase in some of this outsourcing um, call centers, data processing centers, and so on. Those tend to hire women more so than uh, other, other jobs. And these guys document that, um, that actually women, the introduction of these things, or looking at what happens in Bangalore over time, uh, many more women start going to English language schools, suggesting that they kind of, there's a promise of, of more job opportunities, which is having an influence on, uh, on school. Uh, a second possibility, as I said, is you might just pay people for daughters. So this is actually uh, a, policies like this, which this is a, this particular one I'm talking about as a variant, um, are very popular in a lot of places. So the idea is just, you know, look, people don't want to support their, they don't want their daughters to survive because they're expensive. Because ultimately, you're going to have to pay a dowry. They're not going to give you any money. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pay you right now if you have a daughter. So this program in India, uh, it was a, a program with a cash incentive in, in Haryana where you, if you showed up with like a 14-day-old female baby, they gave you some money. It wasn't very much. It was like 500 rupees or something. But it will only apply to very, very poor people. Show up with your baby, you get some money. And then later, they were going to put some money in a savings account, and later you would, you would uh, get some return from that, um, some return from that money when the, when the daughter was older. Now, consistent with, there's a question of whether people should have trusted the future, the future money. Um, they shouldn't have. It disappeared. But, uh, but anyway, so there, there's some sense in which this is like a payment for daughters. And, and the, um, the way we're going to think about uh, evaluating Evaluating whether this is an uh, this is an effective program is trying to look at the the sex ratio, in particular of little kids. So this is number of women, number of really like girls ages zero to six for every for every boy. And it starts. This is Haryana, and this is the neighbors. So in this population, uh, Haryana is actually quite badly off. And this gets to your question about like migration. This is just little kids, and we're at a sex ratio of like 85. So that's pretty low. Um, and so what you want to see, if, if this was an effective program, you want to see that, in fact, this, the sex ratio improved in Haryana more than in these other places after you start paying them for their daughters. So you start paying them, and they should get better. In fact, that isn't what happened. So there was, there's no effect of this program. This program, if anything, there, this, if the actual point estimate is slightly negative. It's certainly not, certainly not positive. Yeah. 
I'm just wondering how big in scope was this project? It would seem to be. It applied to every every. Um, it was a schedule, tribe schedule, cast, the backward cast specific project in the whole state. So reasonably large. Um, not you know, not the whole country. Although versions of this have uh, have been in place in the whole country. It's things like this in other states and, and nationally. What year was that? This is this started in '01. This is like a one oh two or something. Um, okay, so I think you know th this tells me perhaps reimbursement not not our best option. Okay, so now I want to talk about what I think is a really good option, uh, which is which is something like advertising. So in particular, one thing that, that has been uh, that has been discussed in this in this realm is the possibility that that kind of advertising or telling people that they should value girls is a, is a way to improve, uh, to improve the status of women. So for, in, for example, in China, there are these, uh, they have these billboards put up occasionally, which say, you know, where they have a woman saying, I'm so glad I had a daughter, because now my, my friend's sons never come home and they never do anything nice for them, but my daughter is so, is so great, you know, value your daughters and so on. Okay. Um, so here I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different, which is, which is trying to think about whether there's a role for TV. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, relevant, I guess, to the policy options. Uh, I would think China would be an example of a country in which increasingly uh, intra-family remittances will be replaced by government remittances as the government has resources to do it, like a social security system. Um, does that diminish the value of boys as a source? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry? Uh, the question was, was as China gets richer, uh, or places like China get, get richer, uh, we assume that, that like other places, there will be a social, an increase in the, in the government provided social security net. And will that, uh, will that have some impact on people not wanting boys as much as they did before? I think that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, one, some things that people say are like, this is about cultural. You need, some, you need a son to bury you, and it's otherwise to keep the ancestors. I, you know, maybe that stuff is also going to get less important over time. Um, but I, this is something I don't know the answer. But somebody may, or else. Yeah, there's some evidence of that in the movement towards health reform. That's of course the all citizens providing primary care, and there's some. You know, that's a that's going to be a huge investment. It's not enough, but that's an example I think where they are moving in that kind of direction. I wanted to ask you about yeah. microcredit, which has been so successful with Muhammad Yunus in, in India. And uh -huh. has, one of those policy interventions that, first of all, focuses, targets women, as you said, and, and values them. Is that also on your list? Um, yes, it is on. I mean, it isn't something I'm going to talk about, but I would say, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the the uh, the thing I find that I think is is definitely true of microcredit is that is that it is good for women to have a cow. Basically, I mean, I think there, there's a there's a deeper question about microcredit, which is is this the solution to, for like growth? Is this the thing that will cause things to grow? But I think there is no question that this has improved the status of women in a lot of cases. And I think it's again, it's in the same, um, it's in the, it's in some ways very related to this issue of earnings. So one thing you could think is they get a cow and then they have some earning power, um, and then they can use that money, they control the money, they have. There's also a more general point, which is just this is empowering to people, full stop, and causes them to. You know, push harder back in the household and and so on. Yeah. Um, on the last graph, I'm still trying to understand why the outcome variable is the birth ratio versus like family size, average family size. Mm -hmm. did, did you say that it was still going to be a 50 percent? Trust me, we looked. Oh, so so okay, so so there's two answers to that. One is that this is a sex ratio ages <coughs> zero to zero to six. Um, and so this is kind of mostly capturing after, we're trying to capture both sex selective abortion, which obviously screws around with the, with the natural, naturally occurring sex ratio, and also this is gonna capture a lot of the period of excess mortality. Um, and so even if we're, we're kind of acceptable, appropriate at birth, uh, we, we, we see a lot of differences up to age six. Um, the other thing I will say is actually we did look at family size and continuation, and we pushed like the data so hard to try to find an effect of this, and didn't find anything. So I have looked at that. Um, so okay. Any data on what portion of the population actually needs that program? Or yeah, there's some from the state level. They claim it's a lot, which is obviously what's in their what's in their in their interest. Um, it's a it's not the data is not great. 
Um, yeah, so one way to view that is just like this wasn't an important program. I think that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable explanation. Uh, but they certainly claim that people knew. And they did give out a lot of money. Maybe it was also the same one baby. I don't know. It's a little hard to tell. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that I've done with the, with the co-author on, on thinking about whether there's a role for, for TV um, in, in some of this stuff. So just to give you a sense, um, television is the most important thing that ever occurred. Um, and as you can see, it, uh, it has gone up. This is just to, to illustrate it has gone up uh, a lot over time. And, and I can give you, TV has really expanded very, very rapidly in many areas of the developing world, India in particular. Um, and this, this is, these are graphs of like how many millions of, of households there are with TV. This actually, if anything, understates the, the degree of, of increase because a single TV is watched by many, by many, many, many people. So TV, very, people love it. It's the best. OK. Um, and so you know, we're, in this paper, we're going to think about whether television is important for gender, gender attitudes and some gender behaviors. Um, there's, a, a, I think, a central question to begin with, which is why on earth would you think that this would matter? Um, and I think the answer to that is you know, that actually people spend a lot of time watching TV. Uh, in the US, you know, the average American household spends eight hours a day with the television on. Um, in India, this is not so different. It's like three hours or something. And um, if you've never seen TV before, uh, it actually has the potential to provide a lot of information to change the set of people you think about as your peer group. And what we're going to argue is that potentially changing the kind of be behaviors you think are acceptable. So you, what you want to think about here is you live in a, a kind of isolated rural Indian village, which is going to be the sample we're going to look at. For the most part, your peer group is other people who live in your village. All of a sudden, your peer group is like Ross and Rachel on Friends. And, um, and they're behaving really differently, and this is somehow changing. Now, that's an exaggeration, because in fact, what's on Indian TV is things about other Indians. But it is actually quite different than, than it is showing more urban things, which is quite different than what you see uh, in rural areas. Um, and there's actually some existing evidence. Um, this is from some economists. Um, and probably the most kind of anthropologically compelling evidence is on the introduction of TV in the Amazon. And you kind of bring TV into these very isolated places. There's a great book about kind of what people say afterwards. Um, and it has a really big impact on their knowledge of like, whether everyone in the US is a basketball player, for example. They are not. Um, OK, so, so television in India, just to give you a, like a, brief, a brief background, actually starts in the, in the 1960s. Um, up until basically the early 1990s, there's pretty much only government-sponsored broadcast TV, which shows um, you know, uh, a mostly kind of informational programs. Uh, there are some very popular television serials. Um, subsequently, once ca cable and satellite TV comes in about the beginning of the first Gulf War, and, uh, and it is mostly Indian produced TV shows are actually, although I use Ross and Rachel on Friends as an example, Friends does not get a lot of airtime in India. People really like soap operas, like everywhere in the world, soap operas, game shows, and sports. So this is a description of the most popular Indian TV show, at least uh, as of the time I wrote this, this paper. So the Meet This Guy, it's called Because a Mother-in-Law Was Once a Daughter-in-Law Also. Um, meet This Guy, he's a powerful industrialist, he has a lot of uh, family members, they live with him. It's called, his house is called, this word translates to like peacefulness. That's ironic because his family is very difficult and so on. There are a lot of weddings and there's a funeral. Is it really a funeral? No, he's not really dead. Uh, he has a bad case of amnesia. This guy returns in time to, to prevent his wife from marrying someone else. So you can see, I mean, I, I don't, you know, you don't have to watch this show to know what it is like. I assume you all have all seen soap operas before just like pretty much regular soap operas. So I think there is an important question, which is like, that show did not sound like it was like about uh, how you should be, nice, should be nice to women. And I think, that's, um, I think that's, that's right. Gender equality is not a central focus of most soap operas. Having said that, um, if you look a little more carefully at this description, it takes place in an urban area. Empirically, urban areas are, like, are much better on a lot of these measures of, of women's status than Rural areas, also, if you look at the end, this woman who's nursed him back to health and, and she has to realize and accept that he can never be hers. Obviously, things are not going well for her, but she is a doctor, um, which you know, is something you wouldn't probably have seen, have seen as much of. In fact, there's a lot of anthropology looking at how people, uh, how people react to TV. And one of the things that people do say is things like, 
television has caused men and women to open up a lot more, and there are some great stories about men having to do more chores so people can get to the television in time. You know, my wife is making me do this so she can watch her, her soaps. Um, so the, unfortunately, our, our sample does not cover the period where TiVo is introduced, where I assume that would all be, you know. OK, so uh, in this paper, we're going to try to figure out whether TV affects gender attitudes. And I, you know, I, I think just to, you guys know this stuff, like there's, basic, there's this basic issue of, of how, we might, um, how we might figure out whether television is, is important uh, in, in understanding, in, uh, in, in driving gender ratios. So just to, like, I think the obvious way, the first way we would think about doing this um, is some kind of, at least the, with data, uh, some kind of cross-sectional analysis, like comparing places with TVs to places without TVs. That would be like your basic kind of things that I can do with the National Family and Health Survey in an, in an afternoon kind of thing. And I think the problem with this is probably well illustrated in these pictures. So um, th this is Delhi. Now, a lot of people, the study is going to be about cable TV. A lot of people in, in Delhi have cable, and basically everyone has access to cable TV. And one of the outcomes we'll look at is whether people make decisions about their, their health. And actually, a large share of women relative to the rest of India report that they make their own decisions about their, about their health care. In contrast, Bihar is a uh, relatively poor state. Very few people have, have cable. Only about 8% of the people in our sample have access to cable, and a much smaller number of them uh, report that they are able to make decisions about their health care. So you might think, OK, well, let's just, that seems like I'm done. OK, like lots of cable, decisions about health. Not a lot of cable, no decisions about health. But of course, here are some pictures of these places. You might consider that other things are important that are different between Delhi. For example, maybe cars or shirts and other buses, other things. So this is this, and you can do better than this than this comparison. But in fact, cross-sectional analysis like this, I think, in this setting is going to be is going to be difficult. So what we do in this paper is we look at, at a, a panel data set. Uh, it's, we see the same it's a set of 180 villages, about 2,500 women. Uh, and we interview them in three years in a row. First, we talk to them in 01, then in 02, and in 03. And we ask them the same questions, these questions about autonomy, about for, we're going to look at fertility as well. Um, and what you can see is, is that we also ask the village whether or not they have cable. And so when we arrive in 2001, 65 of the 180 villages have cable. When we return in 2002, another uh, 11 to other 10 villages have gotten cable. When we return again in 2003, another 11 villages have gotten cable. And then there are some that never have cable. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at whether changes in, this is maybe easier to see in the graph, we're going to look at whether the, the variables we're interested in change when you introduce cable. So is it the case that when you bring cable television in to a village, that the, there are changes in these autonomy measures? And those, do those line up in terms of timing with the introduction of cable? Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's kind of two sets of questions. One is just that, is, is this actually important in terms of affecting TV watching? And then assuming that that's true, um, are, are there any changes in, in women's status? which are associated with the changes in cable. And the things we're going to focus on here, in particular, are son preference. Do you say you want your next kid to be a boy? These beating attitudes I showed you at the beginning, it's acceptable to beat your husband and blah, blah, blah. Beat your wife, always acceptable to beat your husband. Um, these things about autonomy, so do you make your own decisions? Do you decide how to spend money? And then we'll also look at, at fertility. Yeah. Are you assuming that the access to health care remains constant among those years as well? Yeah, so we are. Um, and I think you know we have we have some measures which we can control for. So we have like, is there a clinic in the village? Is there? And we have those things, and those don't make those don't make any difference. Um, if there are things we aren't seeing, like more nebulous things, it's not we're not necessarily going to be able to get to get at that. Um, and I think that you know the big threat to this. I'll talk about a little bit this about this in a, in a minute. Is the the possibility that something else is also changing at the same time? Um, and I, we're going to argue the answer is no. Um, so all the graphs look like this. This is the simplest one, which is just as cable TV promote TV watching. So you can see this is a share of people in the sample who say they watch TV in the last week. This is of these 2,500 women. And remember, it's the same 2,500 women in every year. We don't, it's not just the same village, it's the same people. Um, so in the places that always have cable, about 70% of them 
and say that they watched TV in the last week, and it's, it basically is flat over the sample. This is like 01, 02, 03. Within each of these sets of bars, we're moving forward in time. These are places that changed their cable access in 2002. You can see in 2001, before they get cable, only about 40% of them are watching TV in the last week. They get cable that moves to 80%. Similar level of, of increase for these guys, but in this case, it lines up in terms of timing with their, their introduction of cable, and these are the guys that, that never get it. So this is, this is our identification strategy. This is the ultimate set of results in this paper, is just to say, look, we're going to show you graphs like this for the actual outcomes. This is what we'd expect to see if cable was having an impact on TV watching. We'd expect to see changes in television watching, which line up in terms of timing with the introduction of cable. So this is a similar graph for, for sun preference. In this case, uh, lower sun preference is better, is better in terms of, of autonomy. The share of women who say they want their next child to be a boy. And you can see, actually, this graph looks very similar in the opposite direction, moving down rather than up, to the, uh, to the graph on TV watching. That places that get cable in 2002 start with pretty high sun preference, decrease after the introduction of cable, places that get it in 03, have the, have the same kind of effect, but in, in 2003. Places that never get it are pretty flat. This is a measure of autonomy. This is a composite measure about do you get access to health care? Could you get to make decisions about money? Uh, and so on. And similarly, increase in 02 for the 02 changers, increase in 03 for the 03 changers. Um, the, the other thing we look at, we talked much about, is, is fertility. Um, and we argue we see sort of similar things on fertility. The fertility actually declines in introduction of cable, although these results are noisier because not that many people have babies. Is there a sizable number of abortions from which you can take gender preference? Yeah, we can. So we wouldn't be able to see, we wouldn't be able to see abortions because they both do not get reported, even to the extent they're happening. We have tried to look at. Oh, adoption. Um, we don't see any adoption. We don't see any adoption either. Um, we did try to look at just like son, like share of boys born in these in these things, but it's not the sample is not large enough. Okay. It's just it's just too noisy. Not enough people are having kids. So. Um, okay, and and in fact, statistically, uh, we can look at the at this um, at whether the village having cable controlling for who for the individual person. So controlling for who the person is, and then looking at whether or not the village has cable, we can, uh, we can try to identify whether changes in cable status correlate with changes in within-person reports about these different things. And in all of these, of these cases, um, so for sun preference, there's a decline. There's a decline in the acceptability of beating. There's an increase in autonomy, and there's an increase or decrease in, in pregnancy. These are all quite large relative to their means. So, um, or sorry, they're all quite large relative to the effects of other things on these variables. So they're worth maybe two, two to five years of, of female schooling. So that's like a female schooling is good for all these things. And this is about equivalent to increasing female schooling by two, somewhere between two and five years, depending on the measure. Um, getting to the question of, uh, of, of pre-trends. So is it the case that something, this is like the central threat to identification is the possibility that something else is changing at the same time, which is driving both cable and these other things. So your village is just getting better. Things are getting better. Women are getting better. More cable, more TV. It's the best. OK, so the way that we try to address this is we look at whether there's any impact of getting cable next year. So if, if villages are kind of on an upward trend in all these things, and at some point cable just comes in, then we would expect that villages that are going to get cable next year are doing better than places that don't get it next year. This is kind of a, a direct test for whether there are pre-trends. And in, in all of these cases, we can reject that. The effects of getting cable next year are quite small. And in <coughs> fact, we can reject that they're equal to the, the main effects of cable. Yeah? Um, were you asking the men to how their attitude? We did not ask the men, which would have been awesome. I know. Um, So, um, th so I think that there's, there's a, this, a second issue. In addition to the thing, if you, you buy this kind of a causal story that this is not about other changes, of course, there's a question of what's driving this effect. Um, and this paper, which you can see many more details of on my website, um, doesn't really take a strong stand on, on what is driving this. I think we just don't have the, capa the capability to know, to know the answer to this in the data. So you know, one possibility, which I think is the one that we kind of favor 
personally, although there is no evidence, uh, is that you know, this represents kind of changes in attitudes towards women, kind of desire to emulate people on TV or learning about, you know, kind of gets you to talk to people about, like, did you notice that he's not beating his wife? Maybe that's not okay. Um, so it, it's very hard to know if that's the story. I think other options include, for example, men have to do chores. There's a change in opportunity cost, right? Like, TV is something you want to do for three hours a day, and you got to rearrange your life. And maybe you don't have time for the woman to be constantly asking permission for things. You really got to get things done more efficiently to make time for TV. Um, and then another thing is maybe you just see a bunch of stuff, especially when you think about fertility results, you see a bunch of stuff you want on TV. You think, if only I had fewer kids, like those people on the soap operas, I could have all that nice stuff that they have. It's also possible. Does it cost money to get cable? Uh-huh. Somehow the... It's so like three to five, three to five dollars a month. But th this does bring up an issue, which is like, what kind? These villages are not al being allocated cable randomly. I probably should have said more about this at the beginning. Like, if we randomly allocated cables to the villages, we wouldn't have to worry about any of these things. Like other things changes. We're just randomly allocating. That is not the case. So the big reasons that you, we have, we talk to a lot of cable operators. The things that you need are, some some extent, like people need money, although. Actually, this is not that expensive. That doesn't seem to be something they think is important. Their big issues are like, we want it to be close to close by so we can monitor whether people are cheating, uh, whether they're cooking up to the cable illegally, um, and, uh, and electricity, basically. And those we can control for. Sorry? The TV set Yes, although, again, once you get the cable, so the, the vast majority of the cable operators we talked to just said everyone wants cable. Everyone would be willing to pay for it. Everybody wants it. All the only thing that's preventing us is just it is it is we cannot get to every village in finite time. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that you have, you have to have more money. Yes. Oh, I agree. I agree. Villages that get so this is exactly what this is exactly why this is a good identification strategy as opposed to the like Bihar versus Delhi thing, which is that places that get cable are richer. Yeah. And when we, they're for sure, richer, right? they're richer. Yeah. Yes, nah. but what we're looking at is changes in, changes within a village. So some villages are rich, some villages are poor. Rich villages are more likely to have TV. What we're looking at is there are some villages which get TV. So maybe you could say, well, their income increases a huge amount between these two years and they get a TV. So that we can actually control for. But more generally, if there are just some places that are rich, some places that are poor, the identification strategy adjusts for that, because we control for who you are. And we look, do your answers to this question change between year one and year two if you get access to cable, as opposed to if you are someone who doesn't get access to cable? Now, you know, the, un the unmeasured variable might be, uh, is there more money in general now? But, I mean sure. And so, so what you have to think there is whether, is yeah. you have to think that that cable comes in at the same time as something else yeah. that increases the money in the household. Yeah. Okay, so, so the thing we cannot rule out here is that instead of the, every time cable comes in, something else comes in at the same time. Right. That is not cable, but is exactly having, exactly in terms of timing, right. that isn't income, which we measure, um, and, and isn't predictive, isn't, like, isn't happening kind of gradually over time, but happens exactly when cable comes in. And it is true, we cannot reject that. We had trouble thinking about things that would be that, we are able to look at, you know, is there internet, is there a post office, is there a clinic, different kinds of things like that. But we can't reject that they're just, every time cable comes in, something else comes in. Having said that, from a policy standpoint, if every time cable comes in, something else comes in, you might as well just bring in the cable, because obviously it's bringing whatever's that other thing with it as well. What you said is, is controlled on income. Yes, we control on income. Uh, is the database robust enough to analyze uh, factors that might um, go along with the mere existence of cable, uh, dose response to the amount you watch, uh, whether the entire family watches together, uh, you could list a large number. Yeah, um, it's it's not really. I mean, we have some some things about how much you watch, but not, uh, but not a lot. And the truth is that, like, some people have TVs and some people don't have TVs, but everyone, regardless of whether they have TVs, say they watch the same amount of TV. I'm not sure we can really. All right, so. Um, so, okay, so I think sort of concluding, we conclude a little bit and I'll give some more time for questions then. 
um, if people have them. So I think, you know, they're, in some sense, I, you know, I work a lot on this stuff, and some of it's very depressing. Um, but I think that there are, like, real reasons for, for optimism, especially in the Indian context. You know, TV, maybe, call centers, if you think about these other guys' work, globalization, all seem to improve improve the status of women to the extent that those things are going to go up rather than down over time. I think that's, that's a good sign. I think there are also reasons for, for pessimism. Um, Sex-selective abortion is a lot easier way to, to, to get a girl than, or to get a boy than to wait until you have the baby and then mistreat it or kill it, right? I think emotionally, financially, this is a much less costly way to, to adjust uh, to adjust the gender, and I think you gotta, you know, you gotta think about whether that's gonna, in some sense, could make the problem worse. Um, I, of course, always think that there's a role for economics. Um, I think one of the one of the big ways in which you know we think about this is trying to think about what kind of incentives um, are appropriate to to make people change their their behavior. Okay. Yes. The, um, there is, of course, no question about the prejudice against women throughout the world, which perhaps one way of correcting it to see how the Western world is trying to, those people who were oppressed, to see how they get out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, 25 years ago, my daughter in lab school here was equal to my son, but the teacher said, you make a good teacher and told my son that you will become a good doctor. <laughs> and that was right here in London. Mm -hmm. so this is one. So this prejudice is a learned behavior. And this learned behavior is a disease that cannot get better by just somebody tell you you have a disease. Mm -hmm. As you said, like yep. the person say, oh, I equally might. Yeah. Equality is not something that somebody give you or even offered or demanded. It has to be taken. And one has to see how was it taken in the Western mm -hmm. world, in the US, and all. First of all, one of them was that those who were oppressed realized that they could be equal. Mm -hmm. You saw women, the TV, how many yeah. of them. So unless that person, and that oppression, I don't mean a severe oppression, biased again. First understand that you could be equal. Mm -hmm. Either you have to do it through revolution or evolution gradually to do it. The second thing, all those that are oppressive are not necessarily vicious. That's their opinion. Mm -hmm. And you could see economic situations, say, maybe in some of the Arabian countries, tremendously improve. Everybody is rich, but yet the women are not equal because right. it is the opinion of the... Uh, and they don't necessarily have to be uh, vicious. Mm -hmm. And so once we are prejudiced against one thing, we'll prejudice a lot of other things. We don't know it because once we are not fair against one person, likely to be unfair against mm -hmm. other. So I think it has to be emphasized for the part of the program that gradually those women realize that they have to first think about it, that they could be and try to be equal. Um, money incentive uh, is always there, but it's not, as I said, like in Arabian countries, it's not going to necessarily make it better by just giving mm -hmm. some money to someone. Yeah. They have to take it. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think this is part of the, the thing that, that is, you know, maybe why the television ends up mattering is that you, you're kind of, in some sense, just exposing people, maybe also men, to the idea that, like, there is another way that things could be. This is not the only way that things are, and, you know, that's, that's kind of helpful for people.